good morning. It's good to see you this morning. Glad to be here. It's just been a blessing to, to be back at Chunky. Uh, I bring you greetings from my church, New Fellowship Baptist Church, and just south of Hickory. They were gracious enough to let me come today and, and be with y'all and bring my family with you as we come to homecoming. I want you to know that, that my ministry is an extension of this church because this is the place where God called me to preach, and, and I, I hadn't forgotten that. And I appreciate your prayers and all the things that you've done for me over the years. Helped me get through seminary, and, and it, you've just been a blessing in, in my life and in the life of my family. You know, these past couple of years have been difficult. There's been a lot of things going on. A lot of things have changed that probably some of them will never be back like they were. But you know, uh, I was reading the other day about a gentleman who had told his wife, he said, I I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do something for you that I've never done before. And she said, what's that? He said, well, just wait a few days till a package comes in the mail. Well, a package came in the mail, and it was one of these tubes, long tube. He took it out, and he unrolled it, and he put it up on the wall, and it was a world map. And he handed her a dart, and he said, you take this dart, and you throw it at that world map, and wherever it lands, I'm going to take you. When this pandemic is over, I'm going to take you for two weeks. Boy, his wife got excited because they didn't do much traveling. And so she takes that dart, and she rears back, and she throws it. And it looks like they're going to spend two weeks behind the refrigerator. <laughs> this morning, I want to talk to you about what Brother Moore was talking about, evangelism. I want to talk about that first part of evangelism, and that's prayer. I truly believe that prayer is one of the things we neglect so many times in our own personal life and the life of the church. And I believe that is where the power that we have comes from, is from prayer. And we're going to look at that this morning, but I want to start off by thinking, you thinking about this. As my grandpa used to say, let's get everybody plowing down the same row, and then we'll, we'll go from there. So think about this. If someone asked you to rate your prayer life, how would you do that? Would you say it was good? You know, you may feel pretty good. I'm doing pretty good in my prayer life. You may feel like that, or you may say, no, nah, it's not too good. You may say it's bad. Or maybe even you'd go so far as to say, my prayer life's pathetic. Nobody else will know. You just think about that in your heart. D.A. Carson said, if you want to embarrass the average Christian, what you need to do is ask them about their private prayer life. And I think it does. And it tells a lot about us. We're going to see this morning that Jesus Christ said that you can measure a person's relationship to God by how much they love to pray. Now, I didn't say how much they prayed. I didn't say how long they prayed or how eloquently they prayed, but how much they love to pray when no one else is around. I'll admit in my life, and I think each one of us would, that we often struggle to pray. Sometimes it, it can be a, 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 a tremendous struggle uh, to make our prayer life meaningful to us. You might can relate to the, these words. It says, Lord, Lord, I want to pray, I do, I do, but every time I close my eyes, my mind wanders far from you. It jumps to all the tasks that I need to get done, and the next thing I know, my time's gone, and I have to run. But, that, but Lord, someday, someday when I'm not so strung out, I'll spend the whole day and make up for this prayer drought. You know, I think sometimes that's the way we feel. We know we should pray, but we just, we just don't come to that place. And I think sometimes we have a, an idea about prayer that's maybe not the right idea. You know, we think about some mystical communication with God that He just sweeps us off of our feet and, and we, we, we go through this, this time with Him. But you know, many times we close our eyes and and we have good intentions, but our mind begins to wander. You know, it may, may wander about the ball game that you watched yesterday or something else that's going on in your life, all the things you have to do. Or maybe you're praying for your kids, and, and then all of a sudden 
you get to thinking about, well, I need to go pick them up today, or I've got to do this. It's just all these things, all this stuff that comes into our life when we want to pray. And so the next thing we know, that sweet hour of prayer that we wanted to have is gone, and we prayed very little. There may be some of you here this morning that will, if you were honest, you may say, you know, I'm not truly convinced that prayer really works. You may say, you know, I've, I've prayed for things and they happened, but I've also prayed for things and they didn't happen. And sometimes I forget to pray and things happen anyway. You know, we, 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 we sometimes have those doubts, and you may be in that place today. But it bothers me so much when we talk about prayer and, and, and how we, I think, put it kind of second class to a lot of the things that we should do as, as, as followers of Christ. But like I said, according to Jesus, how much you love to pray is an indication of how much you really know God. Now, I don't think anybody would deny that God has chosen prayer to be a channel for God's power in our life. And when you cut yourself off from prayer, you cut yourself off from the power of God in your life and in the life of your family and the people around you. There's 667 recorded prayers in the Bible. Now, I didn't count those. Somebody else did. But of those 667, there's 454 direct mentions of answers to those prayers. Every good thing that God pours out, He does through prayer. We need to understand that. There's a quote that I have read many years ago that Samuel Chadwick said. He said, The one concern of the devil is to keep the saints from prayer. Our enemy fears nothing from prayerless studies, prayerless work, or prayerless religion. He laughs at our toil, he mocks at our wisdom but he trembles when we pray. Prayer turns ordinary mortal men into powerful men. It brings fire, it brings rain, it brings life, it brings God. There is no power like the prevailing power of prayer. So I want you to open up your copy of God's Word this morning to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. We're coming to a place where Many of you will open your Bible and you'll say, yeah, that, that's the Lord's Prayer. Well, I, I don't like to call it that. I like to call it the model prayer. Uh, Jesus gave his disciples this when they asked him to teach them to pray. And we're going to look at uh, some verses there in chapter 6, and we're going to kind of start before he gives the actual model prayer. But I think if we can understand what Jesus is telling us about the foundation of our prayers I think if we can just get our hands around that, I believe prayer can become to the follower of Christ as natural as breathing. That easy for us if we can get our hands around this. People won't have to compel you to pray. They'll be telling you you're praying too much, and I don't know if you can do that. Before Jesus gives the model prayer, he talks about the wrong way to prayer. Look in verse 5 there of chapter 6. He says, and when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. Now Jesus is describing a person there that, that prays a lot and may pray these long, eloquent prayers, but, but they figured out that they can do that in front of people and they gained the respect of others. That's what the Pharisees were doing. They were, they were seeking to make themselves look religious by praying in, in the synagogue, praying out loud so that everyone could hear them. And they were really using God to gain respect for themselves is what they were doing. Now look what he says in verse 6. He says, But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Now, think about those two verses. There was a reward in both of those verses. The first verse, he said that these Pharisees, these, these religious leaders who were praying to gain some respect of others, using God for that, he said they've received their reward. In other words, that respect that they got from others, that was the reward. That was it right there. 
But then when he talks about us going into our room, to our secret place and praying, he says, and your father who sees in secret will reward you. Now what's the reward there? What is this reward that he's talking about when we pray in secret? Think about this. When you're in secret, when no one else is there, you, you close the door to a room and there's no one there. You even left your phone outside the room. There's no one there. Who's in there with you? God is. God is the reward to prayer. He is the reward himself. That's how we know God, by coming to him in prayer. The main reward of prayer, Jesus says, is to know God. God is his own reward. The person who understands that is a person who loves to go into a secret place and pray because they want to know more and more about God. You know, Jesus here is talking about these people that are, that are trying to gain respect using, using God. Uh, and, and, and I think you could also apply that to someone who, who uses God uh, as, a, as a primary means for, to get what they want. Uh, you know, maybe a good life, a, 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 a spouse or a stable career or, or maybe even to avoid hell. Uh, in other words, people who really don't love God, they love the things that God can give them. So we have to ask ourselves this morning this. Do I find God useful or beautiful? Useful means that He's a way for me to get blessings. He, 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 I can come to him with my want list and I'll ask God all of these things and that's what I'm after is those blessings. Is that what I think God is? That means I think God is useful. But is, or, or do you think that God is beautiful? In other words, it means that when I spend time with him, I just want the pleasure and the reward of knowing God. There's a big difference between loving God for himself and finding him useful to, to get what we want. John Piper uh, gives the illustration of that when he says that many people relate to God like a tire iron, you know, like a lug wrench. You know, a tire iron is a very useful instrument. When you need one, <laughs> that's what you need. It'll help you out of a pinch. But nobody really loves a tire iron. You know, you don't take a, your tire iron out of your car and display it in your house on the wall, do you? No, what do you do with it? You put it in the trunk. But it's very useful to you. You don't want to get caught without it, but you don't really love it. A tire iron can be very useful in taking care of what you really care about, your car. And sometimes that's the way we see God. He's useful for things that we need, maybe peace in our life or stability in our family or going to heaven when we die, but is he not? We don't look at him as being beautiful in and of himself. We don't truly want to know God. Now you need to ask yourselves, which one of those describes you this morning? Do I look at God as useful or God as beautiful? Do I look to God for what I want in life? Or do I look to God as my life? Jesus says the way to know how beautiful you find God is to how much time you spend in prayer, how much you love to pray in secret. How much you love to pray when no one else is around shows you how much that reward God himself means to you. So, we need to ask ourselves, what is our prayer life like? How is it? You know, I can, I can tell you that, that there was a time in my life that I thought God was useful. And God brought me to a place where, you know, I think many times when we pray, we have this long list of things we want. And we just go down this, you know, before long, that gets to be a burden. I think that's one reason we don't pray because a lot of that thing is on their list. God knows we don't need anyway. And he says no to those prayers. And so we say, well, he's not, he's not listening to my prayers. But see, our problem is we go wanting the wrong thing. We need to know God. That changes everything. 
truly knowing God. And when you do that, your prayer life will completely change. I, I, I'm glad about writing down my prayers and keeping a journal of things that I prayed. And I, it, I am just astonished to look back at some of the things I prayed for many years ago. And I'll look back and I, I'll think, you know, God, look how you've changed my life and the things that I pray for. And I think that's because I learned to pray to know God, to enjoy His company as I was there praying in my, my secret place. There's a, my prayers now are, are a lot more about other people than myself. And I want to tell you what, uh, just, just being able to look at the prayers that I've prayed and looking at how God answered those prayers. We're talking about, you know, Brother Moore was talking about evangelism, about having that person that you've been praying for. Let, let me tell you a little story here about a, a gentleman that I'd known him most of my life. And uh, he had a couple of neighbors around him that were very concerned about his salvation. He was one of those kind of guys that you love to be around, you love to talk to him. He's always carrying on something, but he was lost, headed for hell. Could say more cuss words in one sentence than I could probably say in a month. I mean, he could just, he could just roll them out. I mean, it was just unbelievable the way he talked. And, and he was one of those kind of guys, when you're around him, you know, you... You knew you needed to be a witness for him and, 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 and show him what Christ looked like, but you, you just could stand so much, and then you had to get away from him. But it, one of his neighbors came to me and said, Robert, I want you to add him to your prayer list. And I did. And it was probably five or six of us men that were praying for him. It's been several years ago now, but the Lord worked in his life, and he came to Christ. He's still that guy that you love to be around, can talk and carry on, but he's, he doesn't use those cuss words anymore. And some of the things that he said, I, had, I saw him just a few weeks ago, and he, was, he, he, he started using something. He said, he said, Robert said, you know, the Lord's been doing it. And I said, what? I, I, you seeing that? I mean, I just couldn't believe it. I mean, used to, he'd have never said anything like that. But God's changed his life, and he began to talk about his prayer life, and he began to talk about how God had used his private prayer life that he really knew God and I said yes that's where it's at uh, I'll tell you a funny story about him he, he, uh, he was where he uh, was attending church <clears throat> I had the opportunity to fill that pulpit one, one, one Sunday morning and I knew he'd be there and he's one of those kind of guys you never know what he's going to say well as I was sitting there on the front row in the, in the uh, sanctuary. The choir comes in as the service begins, and, and he was in the choir on the back row, you know, and there was a little murmur. The crowd was talking. You could hear people talking. And over that murmur, I heard it because I, I could just feel it in my bones. He's supposed to say something. And I didn't know what he was going to say. Well, I see him stand up, and he says, Robert. And everybody in that sanctuary, he was probably 300 people, every one of them heard him. And he says, Preach, brother, I got you back. I like to cry. <laughs> just, just to see how God works. I'm telling you, the re we have so many rewards from prayer. Knowing God and then seeing God work in people's lives. That just encourages me to spend more time in prayer. So you need to ask yourself, how is your prayer life in secret? How much time are you spending just wanting to know God? Let's move on in verse 7. In verse 7 he says, And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard by their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows that what you need before you ask Him. Now, he's talking about someone that thinks that, you know, if I pray long enough or if I say the right phrase, if I use the right words... That's going to make a difference. Uh, and and he, he refers to the Gentiles there. The word that he used there in the Greek language literally means babbling is what it's, say, it, what it's talking about. Uh, in other words, I can repeat this phrase. I can just babble, babble, babble on and on and on. You just, if I can just get a lot of words out there, somehow that's going to loosen up God in heaven and he's going to do what I want him to do. But we all know that that's not true. Look what he says in, in verse 8. He, and, and, and it says there in that verse, Your Father knows what you need. And then in verse 9, it says, Pray then like this, our Father in heaven. Now there's a word there that we usually just jump right across that we, we, need, to, we need to think about for a few moments. The word Father. 
Jesus is pointing to the closest relationship possible with God when he's talking about your father. The word used there in the Aramaic means daddy. Think about this. God for all eternity has been a father. He hasn't always been a creator. He didn't become a creator until he created. But he has always been a father because throughout eternity he has existed as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But there's something else that I think hurts in our world today. A lot of people have had bad experiences with their earthly father. You know, Jesus intended when he said that for our earthly fathers to be a model of what our heavenly father looks like. But many times, fathers fall far short. And I have had many people tell me, when I talk about a father relationship, they'll say, you know, well, I didn't have a good father. That if God's going to relate to me like my father did, I don't want to have anything to do with God. And I understand that. And I think the mistake we're making is, is, is some people are, are, are really, instead of thinking about a relationship with God, they're thinking about that relationship with our earthly father who was not what God would be as a father to us. So you may be one of those who have had a father or still have a father that, that's not a good indication of what your godly relationship with God is. But Jesus taught us to pray daddy. Now you think about that. If you have that type of relationship with God, he is your daddy. And you go to this secret place to pray to him. I think that changes everything. I'm not there with just anybody. I'm there with my daddy. Now I want to help you this morning. You may be one of those people that, that your father wasn't the perfect father. And, and I know we, uh, everyone has, has their faults as a father. But I, in Isaiah chapter 43, there's some verses that I want to read to you that kind of give us, I think, a good picture of what a father, this relationship Jesus is talking about. In Isaiah chapter 43, it says, But now thus says the Lord who has created you, O Jacob who formed you, O Israel, fear not. For I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, you shall not be overwhelmed. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned. And the flames shall not consume you. In other words, what he's saying is, your Father in heaven will walk through you through the worst things that could ever possibly happen here on this earth. That's the kind of person he is. We're God the Father. He's going to be there with you. That's what a father does. That's what our earthly father should do and give us a picture of that. You think about this. When, when Jesus was at the, the tomb of Lazarus, you know, he came there and, you know, he, he, was, he was four days after Lazarus had died. And something that's always puzzled me about that is when Jesus got there, you know, Mary and Martha and the other family members, and other, they, were, they were weeping. They were mourning the loss of Lazarus. And what did Jesus do when he got there? He wept. He wept with him. He knew he was going to raise him from the dead in just a matter of minutes. But what did he do? He wept. Why? Because he had that compassion for people. That's the kind of compassion our Heavenly Father has for us. Jesus demonstrated that there at the tomb of Lazarus. You see, I think that changes our whole idea of prayer when we go into our secret place with our Father who loves us, who cares for us. He goes on in Isaiah to say, For I am your God, the Holy One of, of Israel, your Savior, because you are precious in my eyes and honored, and I love you. That's the God that we go to and pray in secret to. To know Him. He is that reward. We'll be like the hymn writer, I think, when we get to that point. You know, the hymns that we talk about, that talk about prayer. So what a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. 
or sweet hour of prayer, sweet hour of prayer that calls me from a world of care and bids me ere my Father's throne make all my wants and wishes known. Charles Spurgeon said, Prayer pulls the ropes down below and the great bells ring above in the ears of God. Some scarcely stir the bell, for they pray so lazily. Others give only an occasional jerk to the rope. But, the, but he who communicates with heaven is the man who grasps the rope boldly and pulls continuously with all his might. God is calling us to our secret place to pray so that we can truly know him. I think this world that we live in, I don't think anybody would argue to say that it's moving further and further away from God. And I want to tell you something. Who's in the White House is not going to change anything. The only thing that will change anything is God. We need another great awakening. You know, I, if you're a student of history, uh, you, you know back when, when our nation was formed was right after a great awakening. And those men had experienced that. And that's the reason we're form, our nation was formed on godly foundation. But I'm going to tell you what, we need that. And you know what it's going to take? It's going to take God's people going to their secret place and praying for God to bring spiritual awakening in our world. That's what it's going to take. So I want to challenge you this morning. If you're here this morning and you're a follower of Christ, I want to challenge you to spend that time in your secret place praying, praying to know God because it'll change you when you come from that secret place. You won't be the same person. God is inviting you. He's asking you. He wants to give. He says, seek and you'll find. Knock and heaven's door will be open for you. But we have to realize that that is coming through the response of our prayer. Now, you may be here this morning and you may not know Jesus Christ. Well, I want to tell you what, today is a day of salvation. God is listening for that prayer from you to confess your sin, to admit that you're a sinner, to proclaim your faith in Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross, giving your life to him. It is exciting to me to come and, and, and the service begin with baptism. You know, I think that's, that's, that's something, as Brother Moore said, I know he's like me, you'd love to be in that water every week because that's, that, that just shows that God's working. It shows that the church is growing. And that's what God has left us here for, to do his work. But we don't need to neglect the greatest thing we have in prayer to do that. So I challenge you, ask yourself today, What's my prayer life like? Let's pray. Father, Lord, we come to you this morning just praising you for the blessings of being able to gather together, Lord, and to sing praises to you. Lord, to see two new Christians, Lord, be baptized. And Lord, we pray that, uh, that this is the beginning of their Christian walk. And Lord, that they'll be uh, continuing to grow in you, that they'll be found in that secret place, knowing you, Father. We just thank you for them. But Father, there may be someone here this morning that hadn't made that decision. They hadn't made Jesus Christ the boss of their life. They hadn't given their life to him. But Lord, I pray that as we come and we close this service through the, having this hymn of invitation, that your spirit would weigh heavy on their hearts, all of our hearts, Lord. Lord, just let us feel your presence as we think about our prayer life. And as those that maybe don't know Christ, Lord, think about uh, coming to Christ. I pray that your spirit would call them, would bring them forth, Father. Lord, as we sing this hymn, I know that this altar is open. It's always been open. And I pray, Father, that we would get right with you, that we would make all the decisions we need to make this morning before we leave this place. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.